Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Not only, well, the only thing is that uh, the weather is beautiful and there is quite a fear from outside, but as competition climate, we are used to stay inside the door. Um, it is my pleasure to be with you here, although uh, it's a very busy moment in the life of uh, the IFSC. We are coming from the first World Cup of the season. We have the second World Cup in a few days. I have to go to Rome tomorrow and this is my life. <laughs> and uh, I have a surgery actually five weeks ago. Fortunately, it was a, a hip replacement and uh, with a technique the doctor's medicine says today, if I reach, you see I'm here. Unfortunately, I cannot climb yet, which is a big issue, but they promised me that in three months I will be able to, to do it again. <laughs> so I will take this uh, opportunity to talk about what the IFSC does, but also about the, what we have done in the past, why we are here, the way we got into the Olympics and the challenges for the years to come. And I start with this picture that uh, in this same natural ball climate, we are all natural ball climbers. You remember the, the last video that was shown just a few minutes ago? And how old was that boy? Three years? Three years? Two years? I don't know. The question is, how many sports in the world can be practiced by a three-year-old boy? Probably they can run a little bit, they can jump a little bit, can they throw things? Yes, they can throw things. <laughs> <laughs> they cannot go surfing. They cannot go skateboarding. They cannot play football. So actually what, uh, what they are able to do is to use the basic motor skills of human beings. And uh, this is key to understand why climbing has been so successful over the years, in the last years, especially from the moment when you were able to propose <coughs> the young generation and not only the possibility to climb everywhere. Climbing is an instinct, is natural, spontaneous, primordial. We are able to climb even before being able to walk. If you are children, you know what this means. You have to keep your eyes open all the time because they climb everywhere. But where the story started? Well, in our mind, or in the common people's mind, the story started from outside, in the outer. Here we have an example. We have the Mont Blanc, we have many peaks, many rock faces. <coughs> but already in prehistoric ages and later, the human beings needed to climb. They needed to climb to escape those risks they could face on the ground. The wild animals, floods, fires, etc. etc. But in the last two centuries, Humans rediscovered climbing to climb the mountains, and in particular, the steep rock faces. And it was time for adventures. But then, in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, a new concept started prevailing. Less risk, more athletic performance. And this was the birth of the sport of climbing as it is conceived today. And this concept resulted in the first climbing competition. You, Pierre, you are talking about 89, I'm talking about 85, so four years before. When, uh, well, actually we were a group of climbers in the city of Torino where I live, which is really close to here, just the other side of the mountains or the Alps. Um, we were approached by a sport journalist who proposed us to organize competitions. I must tell you the truth. 
In those years, climbers like me, uh, those who were around 20 years old, we were a, a social marginal. We didn't like rules, you know. We were sleeping in the woods. With... So it was quite, um, quite difficult to consider the proposal. But then I was starting my career, my real life, my, my, my job as a sport journalist. And uh, I had the feeling, with my friend, we had the feelings that <laughs> this sport had a future. So we decided, okay, let's try to manage the sport ourselves. Let's not do what uh, we see in other sports, what the bureaucrats are managing the sport. We are climbers. We want to manage our sport. And this is when the sport started. But in the beginning, we were on rock. And, uh, well, we had some time to alter the rocks in order to create a field of play, guarantee fairness, and the possibility to climb hard roads. So I think that the seeker, the resin producer, were happy because. Uh, Actually, we use a lot of it, and uh, but this was not really nice. Although the cracks, the rock that we used were usually not climbable because it was loose rock with the sink, anything can become climbable. And also, but it was a matter of concern, the impact on the environment. In the third edition of uh, Sport Rocha, we had uh, in Bartonetti in 85, we had uh, six, seven thousand spectators. In the second edition, 86, we had uh, 10,000. And we calculated, actually, the, the, the road was closed, so people were taken there by bus, so we know exactly how many people were there. And you can imagine 10 people in the nature all together, well, you can imagine the result. And things and also you destroy them. So someone started thinking of uh, building to create climbing opportunities in those with uh, what we called at that time artificial poles. And already in 86, in fact, in France, in Golan Belon, which is a suburb of Lyon, we had uh, a competition. Simply it was the wall of the theater of the school and they fixed some holes, very, you say, <laughs> you say, uh, basic, basic holes and we ran the competition. We did, uh, they even made a little ceiling roof at the, at the top, it was really uh, something handmade. Uh, but then the year after, in Argo, with the rock master, they built the first artificial structure for, for, for competition. And this was a complete revolution because the development of the artificial structures, then you will say you will see that we are not calling this artificial anymore for some good reasons, never stopped. And now we have climbing walls everywhere in the world and plenty of them. But we will come back on this later on. So we started this new sport and thanks to this um, the climbing wall that were built in the cities, not necessarily in the mountains, we created, we started a sport for all and everyone. I, I want to underline this because it's really important to have the perception of the reality. The reality is that, especially in the climbing gyms, we all climb together. Young people, youngsters, elder people, boys and girls, elder people, men and women, and people with a disability. We all climb in the same place. And we inspire a healthy lifestyle. Healthy because if you are not fit or almost, you cannot climb. So the challenge is to move your body a little bit and go climbing. The other uh, key of the development of climbing is 
that with, the, with these structures, you can climb anywhere <coughs> and anytime. Not only competitions, here we have uh, some pictures of what we did in 20, well, five, six years ago. We built up a, a climbing wall in St. Peter's Square, St. Peter's Square in Rome, and we run a, a friendly um, speed, uh, speed event. So we created uh, a new generation of climbing, and all this process uh, saw a great success in 2012. 2012, when we had the World Championship in Paris-Darcy, it was the first World Championship in Paris-Darcy. We had uh, we saw it was sold out for the final, 8,000 spectators, and important to remember, we had an official visit of the IOC observers. It was the first time IOC attended one of our events. And actually, we made a good impression. And of course, I must say that uh, the tradition in Chamonix was already prospered. And uh, Chamonix is, uh, is really one of the events that our athletes love the most. Because there is a fantastic atmosphere. <coughs> well, according to the police department, uh, uh, if the weather is good, we have uh, 10 to 12,000 people watching. But even if the weather is bad, we can have easily five or 6,000. So which is amazing, you know, all the people under And sometimes when it rains here, it's not just pouring rain. <laughs> Heavy rain and people stay in watch. And uh, I mentioned before the climbing infrastructure. When we prepare the dossier in order to convince the International Olympic Committee to accept the sport climbing into the Olympic Games, we discovered that today there are climbing infrastructure, climbing walls in more than 160 countries. At the moment, we have data regarding the um, increase of climbing gyms and climbing walls for the five years between 2007 and 2012. Climbing gyms increased 50%, climbing walls 200%. We don't have the data for the next five years. We are waiting for that from the climbing industry, but likely it will be much more. And then, of course, uh, this is something that um, I can never forget because we can, I cannot forget from where I started. Sport climbing speaks to the young people and get them involved in sport they can practice for the rest of their lives. It's something... I have a very good friend who is the president of the Box Lake Federation, the Federation I use in my executive board member. When he finished compete, competing, he didn't practice Box Lake anymore. <laughs> In our, in our sport, it's completely different. Not only after you finish your uh, agonistic competition career, you can go climbing hard routes. Actually, many of our top athletes are climbing hard routes uh, during their competition career. But uh, I mean, even when you are much older, maybe you don't have the, uh, I mean, the strength to climb hard routes. You can go climbing, and you will always fine, and a good for you, a good for you. So, <clears throat> sport climbing is also cheap. It's a low-cost investment for young generations, while remaining open to other generations. And this is the unicity of climbing. If you compare with any other, many other sports, you know, you need climbing shoes, you need chalk, and then you go climbing. And upon a survey that uh, uh, it was made uh, in Europe, of, I think, well, three or four years ago, this is my, one of the most profitable sports in terms of investment. And that's the other reason behind the fact that the gyms, the climbing gym, are really booming all around the world. And there are two sports that are considered the most profitable, profitable in, terms, in terms of investment in infrastructure. One is dance sport, because you just need a room, you put 100 people there, a good trainer, 
a good, uh, uh, to say, stereo system, and that is that. You have 100 people paying a ticket to dance and move their body for one hour. In sport climbing, you have a gym, and you have almost the same. Because in one hour, you can have more than 100 people. If you have a good gym, uh, big enough, then you have 100 people easily climbing in, uh, at the same, in one hour. And then, if it is a Buddha engine, if you want, you are alone and you want to meet friends, you go there, you find friends, you climb with them. You are a little asocial, you want to stay on your own, but you love climbing, you go there, you climb on your own, you have fun, and you don't talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> Climbing is offering a generation of reach and an affordable, affordable activity in the today's economic environment. As well as the poorly developed areas in the world, the vertical dimension offers a step up in each and every one of life. Yes, because when they start climbing when they are very young, they, they get a, a strong self-confidence and uh, this is used also in the, in the normal life. Uh, normal. We see now, especially after uh, the acceptance in the Olympic world, that many African countries they are building infrastructure for kids in public parks and other uh, areas. So one of the key to get into the Olympics was is the youth appeal, because as we said, is a national movement, is trendy. And is young. The FSC after the average age is 23. In some countries, is, for example, Japan at the moment is 17.5. Uh, we have Romain, uh, Romain Legrand. Legrand. <laughs> uh, he, he is really a champion, but he's almost 30, so it, uh, he, 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 put, he puts the bar a bit higher. So. Um, and 40% of worldwide climbers, competition climbers, are under the age of 20. And then there is something that uh, is not written here. It's really well gender balanced. So we have all of the same number of boys as girls. In the very young category, sometimes you have more girls than, than boys. And then, as I said, the outdoors are there. So the motto is, Go climbing and stay active. And you know, you know perfectly as a public operator that one of the major issues in our society today is the inactivity of our population. Now let me spend um, a couple of minutes on uh, something that probably uh, didn't make sense a few years ago. Now it's almost finished. You know, there was a uh, some frictions between natural and what was called artificial. You know, someone said, uh, if, you, if you climb on plastic, it's not climbing, it's, uh, it's artificial climbing. So usually I make uh, this example, real climbing and real swimming. Um, the swimming pool water doesn't exist can drink it, and uh, it's, it's full of chloro. But nobody says that swimming in a swimming pool is not the same as swimming in a lake or in the sea. So there is no real climbing or artificial climbing. Climbing is just climbing. Then some figures about the climbing pool. Well, this is quite surprising. This is, uh, it, it, it really, we, we, we made some estimation of the climbing populations around the world using some parameters that are used by other international federations. <coughs> and actually the figures are more than 30 million. Um, and we are not using the system that, for example, the FIS is using. 
of the fees, the International Ski Federation, you go skiing once a year and you are included in the statistics. So that's why they have nearly 100 million of people skiing. But now we have also another concern. concern. <coughs> the population, climate of population is increasing drastically. Question today is how many climbers can box <coughs> around the world cost? Because when a climbing gym is saturated, you can build a new one. But when an outdoor site is saturated with climbers, we need to protect it. That's the reason why I'm the president of a climbing club in, uh, in Torino, where we have 1,500 members. I never encourage them to go outside, I must say. Because imagine in Torino city where I live, we have four clubs with, with around uh, or more than 1,000 members, plus others smaller, so for a total of 5,000. 5,500 climbers, licensed climbers. Well, if all of them go climbing outdoors, it would be a disaster. So I don't encourage them, so when I go climbing, there are not so many people around, but this is the second reason. The first reason is that the impact of this huge population on rocks is not sustainable. And then the other point about climbing outdoors is that you need skills. Climbing, I think that the, over the years, the uh, misunderstanding between climbing and mountaineering has been solved. Because, same as many other sports, climbing can be practiced in the mountains. When you go climbing in the mountains, you can call it mountaineering. But you don't go mountaineering because you climb the other point is that the sport in the mountains requires the proper skills. So we cannot encourage people to move from the climbing gyms to the mountains or even to the natural rock because they don't have the skills. And this is the big challenge that in the future the mountaineering association will have if they want to make a bridge between sport climbing, what, what we call sport climbing, and other types of climbing. So, resuming these three concepts, climbing is not a mountain sport, but can be practiced in the mountains. Climbing in the mountains or in the outdoor might create environmental concerns and requires proper skill and preparation training. Then we go to history. Yes, we started in 1985 with Sport Roche. It was the name that was given to the first, uh, to the first event that we managed. And then Bola Melan, as I mentioned in 86, but that same year, we had a combined event, Arco and Bartolomeo. And then from 87, Arco started the Rockmaster, and from the year after, this was uh, done one on a plastic wall. In those years, the sport of climbing was managed inside the UAA, the Mountaineering International Federation. <coughs> we started in 1989, the World Cup. At that moment, it was lead and speed. <coughs> In 1991, we had the first World Championship that which was held every two years afterwards. In 1992, the Youth World Championships. The first World Championship was in Frankfurt, in Germany. The first uh, Youth World Championship was in Basel, in Switzerland. And after 1992, we are running the Youth World Championship every year, which is a huge event with 1,000 climbers at the moment because we have three categories of uh, uh, uh. Then in 1999, we started the World Cup in both. Well, the sport was growing and frictions and fights were, were growing as well in 
inside the UAE. So finally, in, 90, in 2006, we tried to find the structure that would accommodate everybody, but the, the mountaineering area section of the UAE didn't like this solution, so they invited us, the sport climbing body, to leave. And this is actually what we did. So in 2007, we found it uh, in the IFSC for the 27th of January in Frankfurt. We founded it with uh, 57 countries. In the same year, we got, uh, in December, the provisional recognition of, uh, of the IOC. This recognition became definitive in 2010 in Frankfurt. Then, everything went fast. I would say even too fast. Because in 2012, we uh, were in the short list for Tokyo 2020, but then we didn't succeed. There was quite a, an unpleasant situation when uh, the IOC won, well, at that time, in order to have a new sport in the games, another sport had to leave, which was not really a nice solution, you know, why? putting athletes against athletes. I have nothing against any sport. Why should I hope that another sport go out and in order to get it? That was quite a, an unclear situation when the wrestling was initially put out and it was re-admitted so there was no plans for new sports for Tokyo. However, we had uh, election in the AOC, a new president, open-minded and uh, something changed. There was uh, approved uh, a charter called Agenda 2020, Olympic Agenda 2020, and then the door reopened for, for Tokyo. It was not easy, but uh, you know, uh, the key point was then the showcase we had in 2014 in Nanjing at the Youth Olympic Games. This was the first time the or climbing had an appearance in the Olympic Games. We created together with uh, Wushu, uh, skateboarding and roller sport, a sports laboratory where finally the Olympic family could come and watch. They, ah, they said, ah, this is not climbing Mont Blanc. No, it's not climbing Mont Blanc. It's quite exciting. It is. So, so this was really the turning point, so that the next year we started a new process for the additional sport in Tokyo and, uh, well, uh, yes, we, we had to work a lot. We were lucky that uh, Japan has a very strong team, although at that time nobody knew it in Japan. So we made uh, several meetings, presentations, interviews, and finally, in 2016, we were approved as a new sport for 2020. And this also helped the development of the sport in Japan. Because as I said, although they, they you know, Gushi was already winning the World Cup in those things, but the media didn't know. So it was re really a strange situation when uh, in the press conference after the presentation we made to the Tokyo Organizing Committee, the first question uh, they, they made to me was uh, regarding the shortlist, uh, maybe you will be accepted. You apparently are good climbers in Japan, why we don't know? And they said, this is actually my question to you, why <laughs> you don't know it? So I challenge you, I said, and from now on, give exposure to your athlete and to our sport. And they took me seriously because uh, when we have a World Cup in Japan, we have 120 journalists, uh, all the television, and today we are broadcasting live in Japan most of the Buddhist World Cup and also other events. So it's a good example. And for me, it's a good example because it's promising also for Paris because if we succeed, being so popular in Japan, excuse me, 
Why not in France, where we know that sport or climbing is the fourth sport, scholar sport, practice in school, you know, and there are, <coughs> you have, you know, so uh, tradition, Chamonix, Paris-Tercy, and not only, you know, they are so uh, next week, etc., etc. And last but not to be, this counts a lot, made of hopes, because uh, Roman may be, but, he is a uh, evergreen, you know. So, <laughs> so and uh, so we were selected for for Tokyo, and uh, we were selected in these uh, strange conditions. So that is important to, to to explain, because as an additional sport, we are not benefiting of the revenues of the TV rights. Most of the funds that the International Federation, Olympic International Federation are getting from the IFC are coming from TV. In other words, the smaller sport in the, in the Olympic Games get uh, some millions of dollars for TV. We don't. So we are in this, uh, mm, I would say, crazy position where we have to manage a sport, an Olympic sport, we all the commitment and the requirement of uh, the others. Uh, well, just to give you an idea, the IOC annual uh, fund, institutional fund, moved from $25,000 to $70,000. Better than nothing, but you understand, it's just it's less than a salary for one person. So, but maybe things are changed. In addition, why I'm saying that? Because, you know, we were selected for Tokyo a couple of months after that, the AOC came to us and said, would you mind to be also in Buenos Aires at the Youth Olympic Games? Well, my reaction from, from inside would be, thank you very much. No. But you cannot say no to the AOC. So you have to say yes. So in addition to the preparation of Tokyo, we had to prepare Buenos Aires this year. Because actually we were told one year ago, one and a half years ago, which is very important because clearly this is the first Olympic participation and they will be watching us and in the perspective of Paris and maybe Los Angeles of course we have to deliver the perfect event for us it's also good because we are testing many things in order to, to, to be really perfect in, uh, in the in the meanwhile we improved we increased the number of members we have 97 members countries when i say members is countries it's not uh, because we know that some uh, association that have four members per country and then at the end maybe you have 100 but uh, if you have 60 countries in the, so at least 97 countries represented we could have uh, many more because you saw the climbing gyms are and we have climbing infrastructures in 160 countries but we prefer to have federations that are which are really active. So in these 97 countries, there is an activity, there is a national championship, they have a team, they have a partner. It's not just uh, an association of the And then I put all these logos to show um, that it's not only the preparation of Tokyo 2020. We are now in a strange situation where we are a member of the association of the recognized sport, but also a member of the association of the Olympics. Uh, we are a member of the federation of uh, universities. We just celebrated the University World Championship uh, two weeks ago in uh, Bratislava, in Slovakia. We are in the World Games. This has been the, the most successful event in the World Games in Wroclaw last year. Everything helps, but everything demands. <laughs> it's, it's additional, additional. We are in the military, in the military uh, world, uh, world Games. In this case, it's not a big issue because the military the manage themselves. We just, you know, say yes. We sign a memorandum of understanding, and then they are done. And then there is a proliferation of new multi-sport events. For example, next year there are these uh, uh, World Beach Games. 
World Beach Games is an event organized by the Association of All the National Olympic Committees. They ask us, well, we have to say yes, you know, but <laughs> not because the place where these games are organized is beautiful, it actually is on the beach in San Diego in a very iconic uh, uh, spot, but because we cannot, uh, we cannot refuse. But uh, really, we are stretching our possibility beyond the name. Someone who said, ah, you are climbers and do what you want. Uh, yes, but uh, we do not uh, like to become victim of the success. Because if we die of the organization collapse, then there is no success anymore. So resuming what, uh, where we are at the moment, we, we have 97 countries, about 40, more than 40 top international events uh, every year. We give uh, about 3,000 licenses because all the athletes, young athletes or senior athletes, they must have a license to go be in our event in order to control the, the, the have a medical certificate, the sign the anti-doping policy, etc., etc., and as I said, active national then I wanted to, to spend a, I want to spend a few minutes on this because what is the trend for the future? This is a, a climbing park that has been built in the center of Chicago. It's it's uh, it's like a crack in the city, and in fact, in Tokyo we will part of what is called the urban cluster. So what the IOC is trying to do is to propose sports that are considered urban, like skateboarding, which by definition is urban, in order to give the possibility to the people to be active and practice the sport in the city. So as I said, now I said in the beginning, um, the more Parks like this we have, the more people will go climbing, but probably we will preserve the, the nature of the nature. So you see it's quite impressive, they are just in the middle of the, of the skyscraper. And you know, you can put the, this is a wall, this is the drawings of the wall that they used the world games a few years ago in, uh, in Colombia. You can put the wall anywhere. So, from these pictures of 90, 1985 and 1986, you see Stefan Globax in the middle of this Mickey Mouse band, really in about 1985. Down below, uh, Patrick Etlanger, Jacques Jacques Godot, and the car that was used in 1986. You see, it was quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, we are not using paper anymore. <laughs> Yes, uh, so from, from there to Chamonix, this is, a, this is a picture from the drone. Then now we don't have drones anymore because it's quite difficult to fly with drones over the factory. We are not allowed to fly with drones anymore. But this is a thing Chamonix to is. This is Adam Ondra performing as a, um, in the Ministro. This is uh, the, the market uh, square in, uh, in Innsbruck, 5,000 people. And then, uh, and then they are a picture of, uh, of bouldering. And then last but not least, speed. Speed is, uh, is, uh, is interesting because uh, we, have a, we have an expression in Italy, we say, I know my chicken. I know what is to come because you know you people. Uh, it's not offensive, right? it's not offensive uh, for, for you. Uh, years ago, I asked the question to our national federation saying, You want to keep speed or not? Because rumors always circulate, you know, speed is not real climbing, etc. I understand. You don't want speed, you are speed. Unanimously, they said we want speed. So we support speed. And speed now is, is growing a lot. Especially with the, the record wall that you see just outside. And if you have time to, to 
you watch the speed competition, you will see how exciting it is. Speed brings competition close to everyone because it's really easy to understand. You know, we have the dual and the time and things like that. And speed is very much loved by the AOC. And then and here we go into what we did with the with Olympic Bid. Because the funny story is that we proposed lead and water in a combination to Tokyo 2020, but the AOC said, no, we want to have speed. So eventually, we had to invent something new, that is the combine. The combine was the only solution for me, because, first of all, the AOC wanted speed. We didn't want to have speed only. We didn't want to have two disciplines only, for a very simple reason. If you have contact with your national federation or your national Olympic committee, probably you know that now there is a lot of money available for the Olympic preparation. But the combine, we knew from the beginning that we had we would have only one medal. They said it from the beginning. From the beginning, the agreement was one medal and twenty boys and twenty girls. So there was no discussion. So we opted for the combined because if we had left, left one discipline behind on the national level, that discipline would have been put apart. This is a trick to say all the disciplines are equal. That doesn't mean that the situation will improve in the future. We really hope. This is the first step. Even skateboard, the skateboard, the snowboarding in the beginning you had uh, only one discipline. Now they have four or five events. So it takes time. Unfortunately, the cycle is for years. You know, you have to wait a little bit. Um, yes, so this is Chamonix. I'll just show you where we are with, uh, with Tokyo. You know, this is this is interesting because uh, we are bringing something new in Tokyo. It's, uh, well, of course, it is a drawing that shows um, actually the, the field of play, the access, and uh, maybe give an idea how complicated it is, you know, because you have to calculate the number of spectators, you have to combine your event together with, uh, with other events in order to have, uh, uh, not to have overlapping in the same areas because, and this is the other news, that is uh, really interesting. We share the venue with Basketball 3 on 3. Basketball 3 on 3 is a new event in the, in the, in the Olympics. They will start, they will have uh, seven day um, matches, matches for seven days, then there will be a transition, they will remove part of this uh, passing. So you see, this is the field of play of basketball, this is our goal. These are the tribunes, the bleachers. So after basketball is finished, they will remove uh, part of these bleachers, and then we will have the, uh, the four-day sport climbing event. Um, yeah. the, it's like in Chamonix, it's outdoor. And the big difference is the temperature. <laughs> the talk in August is not Chamonix, but it can run like Chamonix. And they have the earthquakes, and the typhoons, so... <laughs> so, um, so, this is the, the, the two events, one made for women and one made for men. Bronze, and silver, and gold, three and three. And uh, I put this logo here. What is this? This is the Olympic Broadcasting Service. It's the IOC that uh, produces all the pictures of the Olympic Games. So, they rule everything. <laughs> okay, this is, but uh, for us, it's interesting. Because, I mean, they are open mind, and we try to be open mind as well. So, when you talk with them, sometimes they show you possibilities that you never thought about. I mean, and then together, I think we are working very well. So as I said, 
The gold medal will be awarded on <coughs> aggregate scoring, speed, boulder, and lead. So the 20 competitors will compete in this sequence. The best six will qualify for the final. And we will multiply each score, each ranking. So, to conclude, you say, after so many years you are still here. Yes, I'm still here because for me sport is education. I think that with sport you can bring, bring some values, some social values to the sport, to the, to the world. Education through sport helps to make the world a better place to live in. I think that today climbing has a great chance. If you are a climber, you know the strength of climbing. You can overcome any difficulty. You fix the target, you train, and you make it. I think that climbing can make the world a better place to live in also. So this is a community. The climbing community is not only competition, of course. But we have a unique opportunity, a unique stage during the Olympic Games. And if you prove that we are able to deliver a very good sport, a very new sport, then I think that um, the goal is achieved. And from then on, you will be able to change the world a little bit. That was probably the dream we had when we started climbing.